All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you much for tuning in. Uh, we're going to give about one to two minutes for everyone to have a time to log in. Uh, we really excited to host this, uh, uh, again, this Portland Cote Week session uh, with uh, Donny Clutterbuck. Mm -hmm. How are you, Donny? Doing very well. How are you? Good, good. Nice shirt. Oh, yeah. We definitely match today <laughs> for this, uh, for this uh, celebration. I mean, it's Bastille Day tomorrow, so we got to wear the French color, right? <laughs> <laughs> got it. Um, I like your background. Um, and so, Donny, where are you right now? Are you, uh, where are you located for everyone watching us? Rochester, New York. I was going to say welcome to Portland, everybody, but it's not that time of the decade or whatever. Maybe next year we'll do that. I'm from Rochester, New York. I'm from living in Rochester, New York, which is up by Canada, uh, as far upstate as you can go and to the west, sort of, in New York State. Great. i got to pay you a visit soon, then. Please. A quick uh, you know, traveling is... Uh, Almost back to normal now, which is which is great. Yeah, the bars around here have been at full capacity with no masks for the vac vaccinated uh, all, a month or two now, something like around there, and it feels like it never happened. Honestly, doesn't mean that it won't go back or something weird won't happen, but it, oh, I, I all the trauma is gone up here anyway. Yes, I, I think we, uh, I think it's a it's a really enjoyable to uh, to leave normally. And, uh, yeah. and, being, and being bars and restaurants being full and being able to see everyone operating and, uh, and you know, and have some ex having some exciting cocktails and uh, enjoying life, which is the best yeah. thing. All right. So we pass one minute. Uh, I think we're going to start uh, this session. Again, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, this is Portland Cotter Week, and uh, we have an exciting session for you today. Uh, my name is Xavier Herit, or Xavier with an American accent. I'm the brand ambassador from uh, Grand Marnier for United States. Uh, the Campari Academy and Grand Marnier are very excited to partner one more time with Portland Cotel Week for another educational programming. Uh, for this special edition, I would like to welcome Donny Clutterbuck, uh, and uh, who is actually based in Rochester, as Joseph mentioned before. Uh, Donny has spent some time in dive bars, cocktail bars, is also part of a national board of the USBG and owner and founder of the app Poor Cost. Uh, Donny is going to share his experience and knowledge uh, on finding solutions to problems because every problem has a solution. Uh, we're also talking about Gomarnier because today it's Gomarnier Day. Um, hi, Donny, how are you today? Hanging tough, doing the thing, making sure that we're running a restaurant and doing research for that restaurant. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to, to do some more research for that restaurant. Awesome. Uh, can you tell us a bit more uh, about what made you decide to go to work in this industry? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I, I started working in bars during college or right before, I guess it was during college. It was a way to not work at Subway sandwich shop anymore. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but the smell is something you can never get off of you. And that's true for anybody who's ever worked at a Subway, you know this. So it was really an escape from Subway at first, but then it ended up being a way to continue serving and making the lives of those around me better um, while doing a job. And it progressed over the course of time from dives to cocktail bars to management and bartending. I'm still a full-time bartender. It is something that is, I'm super passionate about trying to leave everyone a little bit happier than they started. Um, and this is just a variety of ways that we can do that. Uh, being a bartender is full of those tool sets. Cocktails are one of them. Great. So you still enjoy the field and being behind the bar and, and continue to create and improve the cocktail world. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, Donny, before we start with your presentation, uh, I would like to bring a little refresher on Grand Marnier. Uh, of course, everyone knows Grand Marnier has been around for a long time, but just a quick reminder about what, because Grand Marnier has a beautiful history. Uh, he has also a rich heritage. Uh, so the distillery was first created in 1827. And uh, back, at, back in the days, at this time, they were making fruit liquors, like creme de cassis, creme de pêche. Fruit liquors were very popular back in the days. Uh, everything started to change when Louis Alexandre Marnier uh, joined the team and created in 1880 the first version of Grand Marnier Cordon Rouge. Grand Marnier Cordon Rouge was born in 1880. Uh, 
it was interesting because it was a blend of cognac and orange liqueur. So back in the days, it was very luxurious and it's still a very premium orange liqueur. Um, let's don't forget that since this date, the recipe remained the same since 1880. Uh, the shape of the bottle remained the same. So again, I like to read insist and bring back there is a savoir faire, there's a heritage behind it because we still single money behind the bar in 2021 everywhere in America or in the world. Um, there's a few facts you should know about Gomarnie. Uh, first, the shape of a bottle. Uh, it's actually the meaning behind the shape of a bottle is the meaning of a post in, in cognac. Uh, so which is something cool to know and to tell everyone. Uh, inside the bottle we have 51% of cognac so half a bottle is cognac, the other half is an orange liqueur. Uh, that gives us a lot of things we can do with it in terms of versatility. Um, we source our oranges from the Caribbean islands. Uh, it's called the Big Aradia orange. Uh, we handpick the orange when it's still green, uh, peel them, let the peels dry on the ground floor, and after they get shipped to the distillery in cognac uh, to finalize the orange liqueur. Uh, it's very excited. It has this orange perfume. It's what we call a bitter orange liqueur, which uh, married very well with cognac. So part of the Curacao family. Uh, one more thing you should know, Romani is versatile. What does it mean? It's cognac based, it's 80 proof. So there's so many things you can do with it. You can use it, you can drink it neat on the rocks. Uh, you can use it as a modifier. We all know the Margarita is a popular cocktail, but also so many more cocktails we can do with it. And also, we can use it as a base spirit because it's 80 proof. So it really gives us a lot of options on how to enjoy Grand Marnier. Uh, and one more thing you should know, there is a great portfolio behind Grand Marnier with a high-end cuvee. Uh, our latest addition is actually the Louis Alexandre, cuvee Louis Alexandre, which is just right here behind me. Uh, this actually latest addition to the portfolio has contain 82% of VSOP cognac, so much more cognac for a uh, And of course, we have also another Romanier called the Centenaire, which was uh, released in 1927 to celebrate the 100 years anniversary of distillery, uh, which contains 82% of exo cognac. So that gives us a lot of, a large range of uh, Romanier to enjoy in so many ways in more casual bar or maybe more refined establishments. Um, so a lot to talk about. I think right now the show is more for Donny. So uh, I'm going to be hosting this session. So please, if anyone has any questions, feel free to type your questions. I will make sure uh, to uh, uh, pass the question to Donny. And of course, uh, I hope you can enjoy this session. Donny, this is all yours. Howdy, everybody. Uh, like Xavier, as we say in the United States, uh, like he said, you can ask questions throughout. Um, we're going to try to get to them as they come up instead of at the end because rather keep you up than catch you up. You know what I mean? So we are going to be talking about problems in solution. It's a double entendre, solutions being cocktails, get it? Also solutions to problems. Uh, as Xavier said, every problem has a solution, but I think the point of this seminar might be more every solution has a problem. Identifying those problems and finding our way through them um, is going to be the focus of this. So I was told that we'd be doing this in combination with Grand Marnier, and I, uh, I've done a lot of re citrus research in my life. I, I, after working at a really dorky cocktail bar and reading a bunch of books, everybody was like, lime juice and lemon juice, they last for one day and that's it. And I was like, exactly one day and there's no change in between that? And how long, how can we make it three days? How can we make it 10? Does pasteurization, does vacuum sealing work, whatever? And I really dove in on lemon and lime and I kind of ignored grapefruit because it already is sort of stable enough to keep up with whatever, uh, don't quote me on this, but I, at the time I thought it was sort of stable enough that we really didn't have to talk about it much. So I just sort of shelved that. And orange juice was so volatile that I shelved that completely. Um, I found in the small amount of research I did on oranges that if you juice them, you have about five hours before it tastes like thin and metallic. Um, and there's a vast difference between directly out of an orange and thin and metallic within that five hour span. This is a huge, huge difference. Uh, noticeable and to the point where I just sort of gave up on fresh orange juice and moved on to cold pressed or pasteurized or something like that and found ways around just using oranges. But um, this gave me the opportunity to dive back into oranges and see what we could do with all those oranges that we peel for Negroni peels or old fashioned peels. And then like, what do we do with the juice? If you don't run brunch or uh, I don't know, drink a lot of orange juice or eat oranges at a pretty rapid rate, like what are you gonna do with all those oranges, right? 
So whether you have this problem or not, it's been a problem for me and I wanted to find a way to solve that. So uh, next slide, pretty please. My life. And yeah, that's right, you're controlling, it's great. Uh, There's a treatise on solutions. A treatise is sort of like a lengthy description, we'll say, or a lengthy proposition. Um, my life re revolves around solutions. I like to provide solutions to problems in every regard. In 2016, when I was given control of, or let's say responsibility of Cure, and it's poor cost, I tried to find an app that would help me navigate that because I didn't really understand the concept that well and uh, couldn't find it, so I made it. And during the course of making that, I got really good at operating spreadsheets, and now that's like who I am, I'm a spreadsheet guy. But I want to make solutions for the problems that I think exist in the world, and that was one of them, and this is also one of them. Next slide, please. A solution is a means of solving a problem or dealing with a difficult situation or a liquid mixture. There's the double entendre, right? But let's stick with the first definition of that as a means of solving a problem. Well, what is a problem? Next slide, click. I'm gonna say click from now on, if that works for you, Mike. Um, a problem is a matter or situation regarded as unwelcome or harmful or needing to be dealt with and overcome. Uh, we have plenty of those in the bar industry, as I see it anyway, and I think that we can sort of just meander through being a bartender and put things together out of a soda gun and a bottle or you know whatever your version of that is and not address them as problems because maybe that's not what you care about, but these are things that I care about. Maybe you do, so let's find out. Um, click. Every solution has a problem or it's a gimmick. Um, next slide, please. Smoking a cocktail is a solution if the cocktail needs to be smoked. Is it missing smoke? Does it benefit from smoke? That is a solution. It is a gimmick if it's done without intent. And just because you've got a smoking box and you want to throw some cocktail that's already great into a smoking box and, and you pull it out and now it's smoked and there's smoke pouring everywhere. It's like, it's a thing you can do for sure. But is it a solution to a problem? Um, that sort of intent is what we are going to talk about, identifying when to do something that needs to be done rather than just doing something because you can do it. Now, where did all these problems come from? Click. Alcohol was prohibited in the United States from 1920 to 1933. In your state or city or wherever you're located, um, you probably noticed that over the course of the last year, a lot of bars were closed for either a year or six months or four months and two or whatever, some cumulative amount of time, none of which has added up to 13 years of this not existing as an industry at all. Um, so imagine the loss of knowledge, like you sat at home for a couple of months, right? And you started to like lose your ability to like care about leaning over a bar. You lost muscles or something like that. 13 years, everybody loses everything. And not only could we not serve booze here, but you could serve it elsewhere. So a lot of the bartenders who knew what they were doing either left or just stopped and did something else and became like machinists or whatever was like doable at the time. Um, so we've come across a lot of problems because of that. Next slide, pretty please. One of those problems is that everybody forgot that vermouth is wine. So you can't just leave wine on a shelf at room temperature because it turns into vinegar. It just tastes like salad dressing, right? So the problem is that vermouth is wine and I want a martini or a Manhattan or whatever, you know, let's say in the, any time in the 50s through 99 or something. Uh, the solution, as is always the solution, what did every dive bar have, or at least they did when I was around early in the dive days. Uh, we have this fruit tray with lemons, limes, oranges, olives, and cherries for cocktail garnish. And that was all we did. That was the prep. There was no expirable prep being done. So olive brine is the closest to, I'm in flavor to dry vermouth and cherry juice is the closest to sweet vermouth. So that's now what we modify martinis in Manhattans with. And most certainly not with vermouth because yuck. And I see that this says uh, the martini and the Manhattan are back, but they're not their best. That's supposed to say self. Um, I must have stopped typing in the middle of a thought there. Anyway, we have martinis in Manhattans. We can make them all through the 90s, but they're really not the drink they're supposed to be. And even now, the dirty martini is like as ordered, if not more, than like an actual martini. Maybe we should just give it a different name or something. Right? I got a pet peeve about that. I'll solve that problem. It's another seminar. Next slide, please. Another problem we have is that bars don't really do expirable prep until about the year 2000, or at least none that I went to or knew about. There maybe, maybe it was one throughout there. You know, Dale DeGroff maybe worked at one. Uh, the problem is there's no prep, and I want a gimlet. Gimlets require lime juice and simple syrup, both of which are expirable, one much more than the other. And the solution is that we have this shelf-stable lime juice product called Roses, the Roses Sweetened Lime Juice. Still around at a lot of bars, still around at uh, grocery stores, and frankly, not totally grotesque. Um, but if you dump some of that stuff into gin, you got a gimlet, right? 
I remember the gimlets of those days, and I really like the texture and flavor provided by that. So we've uh, found a way to fix this drink as well in a very similar way to the one we're going to talk about today. Uh, but that's just another problem that lays around. And finally, next slide. It's the same problem with a different second problem and an even different third problem. Bars don't do prep until around the year 2000. I want a whiskey sour or an old fashioned. You can't make me a whiskey sour because you don't have lemon juice and simple syrup. You can't make me an old fashioned, really, because you don't have simple syrup. You might have a cube, and this is probably a lot of work for you if you're working at a bar that really doesn't have a high level of input to muddle the cube and then whatever. And people used to put soda water in it, and it turned into like a pint glass drink. It just it became a strange thing. So the solution is we have a fruit tray full of all the fruits aforementioned. So let's mush up some things that are sweet into the bottom of the glass and mix like a combo whiskey sour and old fashioned. We call it a muddled old fashioned. Uh, if you're lucky, there's a sugar cube in there, or maybe if you're not lucky, it's a little bit too sweet for you. So, um, next slide, pretty please. We know that the muddled old fashioned is something we don't love. Um, or rather, I don't, so I'm gonna speak in the we right now because I'm assuming that someone out there agrees with me. We can't talk everybody out of these. The 75 year old guy who's been drinking them for 50 years is he wants that drink. And we can say, well, this is not how a muddled, a, a old fashioned is meant to be made. So maybe we should you know, try, try it our way. And he's gonna be like, no, <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. So I'm gonna leave and write a bad review or something. And is that a conversation that we wanna bother having? Well, the solution here is to get in front of that. Uh, we can make the drink that they wanna order and, and have an answer when they say, I want a muddled old fashioned. But try to do it better the way that we think is better. Uh, next slide, pretty please. And here's that uh, that dialogue, that cure that I was I'm getting so unfond of over the last six years. Try an old-fashioned our way, and if you don't like it, we'll squish the fruit for you. It's, uh, how many times do we need to say that? We don't anymore, and I'll show you why. Next. What is a muddled old-fashioned? Uh, it's whiskey, sugar, bitters, and citrus fruit. So it had to be something from that tray, and it wasn't going to be olives, because <laughs> that's weird, and olives have no relation to the old-fashioned of the whiskey sour whatsoever. Um, what citrus fruit should be there? Let's, let's try to identify what the genesis of this drink was, what it's trying to be, and then find a way to do that better. Um, next slide. The acid profiles of all of the fruits that we have to deal with, these are all the citrus fruits in general. Um, we're looking at orange, lemon, and lime in this case because typically there wasn't grapefruit in that tray. If there was grapefruit in it, uh, we could talk about that on some other occasion, but it would be a not particularly interesting part of this. So we have orange, lemon, and lime. Well, what fruits should we use for a middle old fashioned? Next slide, please. In the case of citric and malic acid, uh, well, those are the two prominent acids in all of the fruits listed above. Citric acid hits you, these, these little charts that we're about to go through are presence <clears throat> versus time, as in like how much does it happen and when does it occur and how long for, let's say. So the attack is what happens in the first two seconds. The body might be what happens after two seconds. Um, so in the case of citric acid, think lemons on that one. If you bite into a lemon or you know suck a lemon wedge or whatever, um, immediately you get a bunch of acid, two seconds, and it's gone. You don't really find yourself chewing it. It's aggressive, and then it's not. It goes away. If you do the same thing with a lime, if you bite into a lime, I don't know why you do that, but if you were to, if you have these things around, test this out on yourself. If you bite into a lime, it seems like it's not going to be very tart, and then you find yourself chewing it from two to six seconds. Uh, malic acid occurs a little bit late and lasts a bit longer. So what does this have to do with anything? Next slide. In the case of mixing it with alcohol, specifically, uh, I think we missed one there. Should go back one. There we go. Um, in the case of mixing it with alcohol, uh, that is citric or malic acid solutions such as lemon and lime juice or orange juice, alcohol is also on the attack. It's, you got a couple of seconds on the burn up front, and then it kind of fades away. You do a shot of neutral vodka, sky, let's say. It's just going to be alcohol gone. That's what vodka is there for. That's the whole point um, in some cases. The body of a boozy drink or a boozy substance liquor, whatever, a brown spirit specifically, is going to come from polyphenols, things gained from a barrel during barrel aging. And this can occur from two seconds to five minutes, 20 minutes. If you have something that's 100 years old or has you know 100-year-old spirits mixed into it, the tannin linger is going to be, uh, let's say, very prolonged in that case. So here, between alcohol and polyphenols, alcohol is on the attack. The phenols are what make whiskey and cognac interesting. And that's the two to infinity seconds uh, toward the drink or toward the, toward the middle and end of the drink. Uh, next slide. So if we put these things together, 
we find a daiquiri. Uh, one of the things that we would find is a daiquiri anyway. The alcohol is what's up front. It's white rum. It's fairly uncharacteristic. I mean, maybe there's a little bit of barrel aging and clarification, but it's not extensive. White rum is meant to be kind of neutral. So we have alcohol in the front and then lime. The malic acid from the lime takes over the whole body of the drink. We can call a daiquiri a lime drink because it's sort of defined by the lime. Try a lemon daiquiri. You'll understand why they don't exist. Uh, next slide. In the case of the whiskey sour, though, the functional items are swept or swapped, but the structure is exactly the same. On the attack, up front, we have citric acid, the lemon. So now the fruit is on the attack. And then the body or the character of the drink is provided by uh, barrel aging from cognac or whiskey or whatever, the phenols that are, are taken on during that process. So imagine if you were to make a daiquiri, but with whiskey. Well, where the polyphenols sit there in the middle in the body of the drink, the malic acid also sits. So now you have nothing in the front, a very low front, very high middle, and then who knows what after that. It's sort of defined by whatever the spirit is you're mixing with. But there's a traffic jam in the middle. Malic acid and whiskey don't like each other. So what can we deduce here? Next slide. Lime is probably not the one to go with because malic acid is not something we want with whiskey. And in this case, we're dealing with the whiskey sour old-fashioned combo, the muddled old-fashioned. So it's not going to be grapefruit because it's not in the tray. It's not going to be lime because we have malic acid. Uh, we're between orange and lemon now. Next slide. Lemon juice has the citric acid we're looking for, but it has a 5% acid solution. Same as vinegar, let's say. So like red wine vinegar and lemon juice have roughly the same acid uh, percentage by weight. Um, it's nine bricks, which means it has 9% sugar, and the acid to sugar ratio is 1 to 1 1.8. And if you've ever seen the citrus seminars I've done before this, you know that. Next slide. Our mouths really want a 1 to 10 acid to sugar ratio in order to not feel acid or sugar more than one another. So if you make an acid to sugar solution of water, even if it's just like citric acid and sugar, um, at a 1 to 10 ratio, you will sense that there is acid and sugar in it, but neither will shout louder than the other. Unless you have a palate that errs heavily on the side of a preference for one or the other, you may be more sensitive. But typically speaking, across the population, uh, 1 to 10 ratio is what we look for. So cherries aren't sweet enough to bring that much sugar. They're not muddled into anything. They are not simple syrup. Um, even with a sugar cube, there's not enough dilution or anything to make it like a real lemonade out of that uh, because it's an old fashioned. We're not taking it. It's just going to kind of sit there and be. Um, so what do we do? Next slide. We don't use lemon. That's what we do. We use orange because, next slide. Orange is a 1.5% acid solution in 12 bricks. It is already at a 1.8% <laughs> solution, right? So with a little bit of sugar from either a sugar cube or whatever the heck, um, you can make this into something that is balanced and even airs on the side of sweet, especially with a sugar cube. And when you're muddling a bunch of oranges in, it's more of a dilute mixer, as we say. It's something that you can add a lot of to something, and it doesn't really change the acid or sugar profile of the drink. It just kind of lengthens it or dilutes it a bit. So you can muddle a whole bunch of orange in there and then one sugar cube. And essentially, at the end of that, you might have orange aid or something with a similar acid sugar profile and dilution. So it's easier to make an a la minute simple or a modifier, let's say, that uses acid and sugar with a much more dilute fruit. So I think that's how we ended up with the orange. It's a brief history on what I think happened and how this drink occurred, uh, whether we like it or not. Next slide, please. We now have whiskey, sugar, bitters, and orange. That's where the citrus came in. We know that the whiskey, sugar, and bitters thing is gonna happen because that's what's always been uh, you know, done in terms of both of those drinks. Well, for at least the old fashioned. So next up on the slide. Next slide, sorry. Um, so the problems we have with this drink are not that it doesn't work. It works fine. You can drink it and it tastes like a drink and it gets you buzzed or whatever it is that you're looking for. But problem number one is muddling slow service and requires a lot of touches. Uh, and if, yeah, you can say, I can make a muddle old fashioned quickly. Yeah, you can certainly do that, but you can make it faster if you don't have to muddle it, right? I mean, that's the way I think of it anyway. And although expediency is not the only thing that matters, it's a nice trick. It's cool to have someone order a drink and just sort of like get it and not have to like wait for you to laboriously figure out how to prep something that you could have done in advance, right? So there's a whole bunch of problems with that. Um, number two is my favorite problem here. There are non-uniform drinks in my drink. There are smushed orange bunches. And if you have a whole bunch of orange bunches in your drink, you have to like pick it out of your teeth or chew it. And it's a process that I don't think that should occur with a drink. This is not food. This is not served as like a fork and a knife. It's served in a glass. Um, so let's drink our drinks, right? Next slide. 
The solution here that would solve both of those problems is to make an orange syrup and stabilize with orange liqueur, such as Gremlin. And this is where, uh, you know, I didn't really have any of this put together. I didn't know that this was going to happen until we talked about doing this seminar. And uh, I made this drink specifically for this. And I did a bunch of research over the last few weeks about how to pasteurize and how to clarify and stabilize and yada, yada, yada. And the next slide is going to show you that. Next slide. <clears throat> So the muddled cordial is what we're calling it in what we're now referring to as the method old fashioned because method is order and muddle is disorder. You know, get it? Cool, right? It's not a bad name either. Um, it's a one-to-one -one orange simple syrup diluted one-to-one -one with orange liqueur. So um, first juice all your leftover oranges. And if you don't have leftover oranges, just juice oranges, I guess, or peel them in advance. Maybe make a mass rid of those peels with alcohol, atomizer shoot me an Instagram message about that and I'll tell you what I did there for anybody who cares. Um, so you, you probably peel oranges for Negronis and old fashions. You need peels in your drinks typically, uh, not need, want. Most people, some people want that. We do a lot of that. We have a lot of leftover oranges. It's been a problem. We feed them to the kitchen staff. Sometimes we juice them for brunch, but in reality, a lot of them end up just like getting forgotten about. And I, I don't like that. It's always kind of bothered me. So we juice the leftover oranges. Um, and immediately heat pasteurized to stall the bittering and oxidation. If you read the bar book by Jeffrey Morgenthaler, not that it's narrative based or anything, but somewhere in the very beginning of it, it tells you that orange juice, uh, as soon as you juice it, there's something either in the pith or the pulp, two compounds called NARL and LARL, I think, that almost immediately begin to bitter the juice. So you have a very short amount of time before the juice becomes a juice that you don't want. And my personal research uh, has led to me thinking that's about five hours until it's sort of undrinkable if you're really paying attention. You can choke anything down, but like, it's not fun. So since you have under five hours and ideally under one, um, slap it in a pot, bring it up to a simmer, let it roll back down, it's pasteurized by heat. There are two things you can do at this point. One of them is not necessary. It's just what I did because I really dig the idea of uniformity within drinks. Uh, again, no chunks, right? If you have a centrifuge or you're familiar with agar clarification, um, take all the solids out. Get rid of them so that you don't have to feel like you have to shake it or tumble the bottle before you pour this cordial that you're about to make because eventually the particulate will settle out. Um, it's not something that I like to have to deal with, so I ran it through a centrifuge. So juice the fruit, pasteurize the juice, run it through a centrifuge. Now you have pasteurized, clarified orange juice. You can make a one-to-one -one Demerara simple with that by taking a liter of this clarified orange juice and a kilogram of Demerara sugar and incorporating them. You can use a little bit of heat to do that. Try not to... Um, evaporate all of the orange juice though, because then you're going to get a weird sugar level every time. You know, if you have le less liquid in the same amount of sugar, uh, not a good practice to get into. So I just, I did it at room temp and just stirred it for a while while I was doing other prep. So uh, one to one Demerara Simple with clarified orange juice. And then you have this orange Demerara Simple, which is delicious, but may not be shelf stable, but probably isn't shelf stable because it's just sugar and juice. And uh, those two things don't really. They're going to grow sea monkeys at some point. And a way to get them to not grow sea monkeys over the course of time is take this now, let's say, 1,400 milliliters. No, let's do this easier. Liter of Demerara orange syrup that you have and combine it with a liter of Creme Marnier. And now you have a stable cordial that has the muddling done in advance and uses a product that you probably were going to either throw out or eat or frantically juice during brunch service or whatever, whatever was going to happen to those already peeled, kind of now ugly fruits. Um, and the point of this is twofold, one for stabilization, but two, to add another level of orange flavor that we can't get from just that half an ounce or three eighths of an ounce of clarified orange juice that ends up being in that Demerara Simple. So we can add a little bit of simple syrup that has a slight tinge of orange, but if we dilute it out with something like this, and maybe, uh, maybe, you, maybe you find it a little bit too sweet that way to do a full one ounce pour of this modifier, right? Maybe you want to, or a, a half ounce pour of this modifier rather, maybe you want to dilute it partially with Grand Marnier and partially with cognac or partially Grand Marnier, partially rye whiskey or whatever it is that you can project that the guest is probably going to want. You can stabilize it with all kinds of different alcohols um, as long as there's something that you know are going to be in every drink when it's ordered. So um, let's see what the definition of these things are and get to the next, uh, the next slide pretty please. The definition of muddle, and this is something I referenced already, is to mix confusedly. I think that's really indicative of what that old fashioned is. It is a confusedly mixed drink a method definition. Uh, a systematic procedure, a technique, a mode of inquiry employed by or proper to a particular discipline or art. Now that's the person I wanna be. Um, next slide, pretty please. The muddled old fashioned here on the left, let's go through the build. It's two ounces of whiskey or four or whatever you use at your bar. 
Uh, we try to standardize everything at about two ounces of booze per cocktail, just so everybody knows what they're getting into. And if they have three of them, they know that they've had six ounces, not 12 or whatever it ends up being. Uh, two ounces of whiskey, one sugar cube, bitters, orange chunk, muddle. That's a bunch of things and that's a few processes. On the other side, the method old fashioned is two ounces of whiskey with a half an ounce of orange cordial, bitters and orange peel. Bam, you combine those things, they're pre-mixed, pre-muddled, whatever. Um, slap them in a glass on a big cube, give it a turn. Instead of like stirring, I don't like to stir those things. I think they should start out a little too hot and then end up a little bit easy. You know, that's the, 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 the old fashioned in general is something I like to be aggressive in the front and then sort of ease itself off. So the method old fashioned is missing, not missing, uh, gets to not have one touch altogether and gets to have an entire process removed from it. So just do that before the guests get there. Just like, um, I don't know. Uh, most food is sort of prepared in a kitchen before a guest orders it. You know, like someone doesn't order a brine chicken. You don't start brining it when they order it, right? You brine it before they get there so that the service on the chicken is rather quick. And this is no different than that. It allows you to touch fewer things, have a better product, and uh, treat your guests with, I don't know, whatever, more respect than they expected. Uh, more respect than they expected. Next uh, here, the solutions that we have, we have put together just to list them off, expediency, flavor, mouthfeel, and repeatability. The expediency, clearly it's an easier drink to make. Flavor-wise, we've now packed orange juice and orange liqueur, which is a macerate of orange peels or a distillate of such, um, into that very same drink. So we have it coming from a few angles. Also, if you use orange bitters and an orange peel, you're now getting a separate macerate of orange and maybe even some gentian to lengthen and orange oil on the nose. So now you have orange juice, orange liqueur, orange bitters, and orange peel, right? Orange four ways, you can call it that way too, or whatever, whatever you dig. Um, so expediency, flavor, mouthfeel. We now have a drink, if you've clarified it anyway, and I guess even if you haven't clarified it, you don't have food in your drink. There are no chunks. It is visually consistent, and it feels like a liquid, not like a liquid peppered with solids. Uh, which again, I don't know why I have such a problem with that, but I, I, just, I just can't stand it. Uh, four, repeatability. Every drink is exactly the same drink. If you go through this process every time, barring very slight variations in the acid level of the oranges you're using, which is probably not enough to notice by the time the cordial is made, um, it's exactly the same drink every time with a razor thin margin of error. Two ounces of whiskey and a half an ounce of cordial. Kind of difficult to screw up. It's not like a 2.25 and a 0.38. You know, we're not pouring three eighths of an ounce of anything. If you dilute this properly, not Grand Marnier. If you dilute the cordial properly to achieve your desired level of sweetness, uh, meaning you use a certain amount of liqueur and a certain amount of Armagnac, I don't know, whatever, whatever you feel like using, um, you can make it so that that half ounce modifier is a direct pour um, into the cocktail. And it is exactly the right sweetness regardless. Sometimes if people, if you know someone has like a, this is something I've had to deal with over the last week because I've been making this drink. It's now on our menu at Cure actually, as the method old fashioned. Um, Sometimes if you know someone has a particularly boozy or low on sweetness uh, palate, you don't necessarily have to reduce the amount of cordial from a half an ounce to something else. You can just throw in 114 proof rye or a, I don't know, a barrel proof bourbon or something like that. Do something that you know they will dig without really messing with the amount of, uh, you know, the build doesn't really have to change. Uh, with, with 114 proof rye, this drink is bananas. Um, all right, so what, what are we doing when we go through a process like this? Next slide, pretty please. This process can be broken down for everything. And as I said before, we did this with the gimlet. And in fact, it is exactly the same ratio. The build is different, but the cordial is exactly the same. But instead of Grand Marnier, it's vodka, because we want it to be neutral. Instead of orange juice, it's lime, because it's lime, it's a gimlet. And instead of brown sugar, or demerara sugar, rather, it's white sugar, because we want it, again, to be neutral and light and bright. So we have these two separate cordials that are used in very different ways for very different drinks that have the same fundamental problems or similar ones anyway uh, that we get to fix and you know, expedite. So the first thing we do is we identify the fundamental intent. What is a bundled old fashioned? Where did it come from? Why does it exist? What tactics is it employing? And why are those tactics wrong? Next slide, pretty please. Next. What are the problems that either those tactics to that they used, you know, back in the whenever muddled old fashioned days used to solve their problems? And what problems does this create for us? And when we solve those problems, do we come up with new problems and have to find those? Uh, so we have to identify all the problems. Next up, identify solutions. 
Um, first, we, we try to find the intent. What is going on here? What is wrong with what's going on here? How do we solve what's going on here? Next, and execute those solutions. So you'll go identify, 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 execute. And by the time you execute that final solution, whether that last solution rather, it's not a good series of words to say, um, by the time you execute that last thing, um, you're going to find in a lot of cases that new problems pop up because of that. We have a carbonation system, a cure that we use with like modified freezers to keep drinks at a very specific temperature. Well, as close to freezing as possible. And then we carbonate them to 45 PSI. Like the gin and tonic is a 27 degree, 25 degree in some cases, uh, 45 PSI gin and tonic. Served neat in a little teeny tiny, very chilled rocks glass. Uh, and it's an incredible experience. But it wasn't the first few times we did it because we got so much CO2 dissolved due to the temperature and PSI that the carbonic acid blocked our tart receptors and made the drinks feel fat, and flabby, and weird, uh, gummy almost. So we found that adding uh, 3 eighths of an ounce of lime acid, which is a citric and malic acid solution with the recipe that you can find in Liquid Intelligence, Dave Arnold's book. Uh, we add a bit of that. It's shelf stable. Uh, we can pre-carbonate these drinks for you know, years in advance. We don't, we could. Um, so we had to, we found that by solving the problem of the flat, not very cold gin and tonic, we bumped into an acid problem that we had to like go back to the beginning and go, well, what's the fundamental intent of this drink? The drink is to be snappy and bright. It's not snappy and bright because we've covered up all the acid by using too much CO2. We don't want to reduce the CO2 because we want bubbles so that I identify the problem. Problem is not enough acid. Solution, add a little bit of acid. Execute it. Is it enough? Is it not enough? Is it perfect? Don't touch it. Um, so we go through that one more time. We go, fundamental intent. Is there, is, is there a problem with anything here? As soon as the answer is no, you can stop looping through this. And next slide, make more guests happy. Sometimes you can do it consistently and with expediency and with very low waste and cost. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say about this topic. I'm happy to hear a bunch of questions, engage in any sort of conversation anybody wants to have. Uh, next slide is just me. I just want to be a solution. Final slide, pretty please, if you wouldn't mind. And I, I think, Donny, uh, I think it's very interesting that we used to work away, we learned a way to work with classic drinks, uh, and we work for this, making the same recipes for many years, but how can we think outside of the box and how can we tweak the recipe to always improve? And I'd like to see the evolution of the old fashioned that was in the 1990 or 2000 compared to what it is in 2021. So it's always important to ask ourselves, how can we improve the flavors? And I think this session is very interesting because we have to think outside the box how to get the perfect balance with the flavors, uh, which I think is very brilliant. It's you don't waste much fruits, uh, you save time by making the drinks, you also enhance the flavor. And I like to say that using Grand Marnier in old fashioned match very well because we all know in old fashioned, the orange is the most common fruit that's gonna match better with the, with the, with the whiskey. So uh, I'm, uh, I think it's very brilliant and I hope everyone learns something from that because it's very important to how can we improve. It's important to know the past, it's important to know the, the classic, but how can we improve things to make the future and asking these questions. And without alienating people. I think that's the hard part. We can innovate all we want, but if we're starting to like lose people in the, in the flutter of like why we're doing this or the, pre the perceived pretense of it, um, we can look like jerks along the way. And it's really important to not make people feel bad for ordering something that we, I mean, it's our job to know whether or not that's good or bad or done well or not, let's say. Let's not be subjective about that, right? Mm -hmm. Just because I don't want to drink it doesn't mean nobody else does. But it's, it's our job to make sure that we have this information and that we convey it in a way that doesn't make us seem above, but makes us feel like we're at the same level, doing the same thing, experiencing the same thing, and bringing people in rather than pushing them away. At, at, at the end, it's the, our job is to make people happy. And on the other side of the bar, and and uh, it's important to have a great tools. And I think there's so many uh, uh, the the level of cocktails has improved so much for the past 10, 15 years in in America, or if not in the world. And I think people are more and more educated when they come to a bar because they know they drink more old fashions, they drink right. more negronis, they, they do, their, the their palate is, is more uh, they're more educated into into uh, having some cocktails. So it's important to always continue to maintain and I think please people, but also how can we tweak the, the recipes? Right. Uh, how do we get better without leaving our guests? Behind? Yes. Uh, so far, I don't think we have any questions. Uh, but please, if anyone. As any question, feel free to ask. Uh, there is no bad questions. There's only good questions. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean this. 
if anybody has questions they don't feel like asking right now or it pops into your head at two in the morning tonight or whatever, just shoot me a message at Donnie Clutterbuck on Instagram, that thing. Or it's me, I-T-S-M-E, at DonnieClutterbuck.com is my email address. And you can find it at DonnieClutterbuck.com. I don't know if you'll find anything else you need there. But the contact is my email if you don't feel like typing it in. So you can just go to DonnieClutterbuck.com and hit contact, and that's me. I'm also the contact on the poor cost app that was aforementioned at the beginning of this. So if you have the poor cost app and you just have a question for me, that just goes right to my email account. So hit me. All right. I don't think we have any questions. So uh, again, thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, I hope you learned something today uh, with how can you improve, how can we find solutions to problem? How, how can those, so, um, I mean, how can we improve cocktails also by using Grand Marnier? in an old fashion for, for this example. Uh, it's also a Gormani day today, so happy Gormani day, everyone. Uh, and I hope you enjoy the session and look forward to see you for the, uh, please tuning for the next Portland Cotel Week with the Campari Group. And we have more sessions coming every Tuesday. And uh, Donny, uh, any last word, anything you'd like to say for everyone? I just can't do, wait to do it in person with a room full of people again. I'm not saying that we should be doing that now. I don't know what we should be doing. I just listen to the authorities. I'm just really excited to, to do this still and to be doing it in the future in a room with people. Um, there is a lot of energy here and there's a lot of good stuff that comes from it. It is difficult to pay attention to a screen and uh, I'm sorry you have to. <laughs> well, I can wait for the next one in person as well. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Au revoir. See you in the future. Bye.